All right, folks, it's time for our favorite podcast, Cuts of the Chase, and we have breaking news. So I, I'm like, oh, my God, what am I, you know, I, all these people call me up. So I figured, I, you know, let's bring Amanda Bronsad back on from Law.com, ALM, legal journal, journalist extraordinaire, to discuss the breaking news regarding the largest mass tort trial ever against 3M with the earplugs, the defective earplugs, and all the veterans that lost hearing ringing in the ear, all that kind of stuff. So just to update everybody, I know you've been listening to all my shows. Mike Burns has come on a bunch of times, one of the lead attorneys. July 15th, Judge Rogers, who's in charge of the multi-district litigation in Pensacola, ordered settlement talk after 19 veterans had their cases tried. 13 of those veterans prevailed. Amanda, do you know how many, how much money was awarded in total? Approximate ball figure? Ballpark uh, approximately about $300 million or so. Okay. So we're not talking chump change. All right. So everybody's a lot of, you know, okay. We see the hand, hand, you know, the writing on the wall and let's settle these cases and get these veterans compensated and move on to something else. And then breaking news. And that's where you step in and I'm seeing bankruptcy and it's not even 3M and what's going on. So fill us in. Yeah, so it definitely wasn't settlement. Um, <laughs> they uh, What happened was there's a subsidiary that 3M has called um, Aero Technologies, and it was actually Aero that filed the bankruptcy on Tuesday. It's a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They filed it in um, the Southern District of Indiana. There are actually six petitions because it has affiliated companies. Um, so I thought maybe you guys might be interested in knowing the... Um, lead case is actually Aero Technologies is the one that I've actually been following. The case number is 22-02890. I thought that might be helpful because it took me a while to figure that out. Um, but that's where you can follow what's going to be happening going forward. Um, this particular uh, company is a subsidiary that's been around since 2008. 3M acquired it. It is the company that's been making the earplugs even before it was acquired by 3M. So that's sort of the presumption as to why that particular company filed for bankruptcy. But it is very clear that 3M is not the one that filed for bankruptcy here. Okay. So, but the cases are all against 3M or are they against 3M and, and the subsidiaries? Uh, it's actually against both for a lot of the lawsuits. Some of the lawsuits just name 3M, um, but I would say the vast majority are, or at least both of those companies, and then some of the affiliated ones as well. All right. So, what is your? Or no, is this what chapter bankruptcy? I mean, is this like, hey, we're not paying it anything, or we're reorganizing, or what? What is the chapter that they're filing under? It, they're filing for Chapter 11, and they're definitely planning to reorganize. Um, 3M has said that it's going to set up a $1 billion trust for the claimants, the earplug victims. And then it's also going to provide $240 million in funding for the actual bankruptcy case itself. Um, they said in their petition, in the Aero petition, it said that the company had spent $347 million already in fees and costs um, to deal with the earplug litigation. Um, and then it expected another almost 100 million for this year alone. Um, so that was kind of the premise behind it. But obviously 3M is the financial uh, support behind this as well. Um, and that's where that money is gonna be coming from as well in going forward with bankruptcy costs. All right, did you say 1 million or 1 billion, the trust fund? Oh, for the trust, it's gonna be 1 billion. Of course, the plaintiff's attorneys are saying that is in their exact words, woefully inadequate. Um, so I don't think that's anywhere near where the plaintiffs were thinking. All right. And we're talking about 250,000 plaintiffs or veterans that are part of this case. Yeah, about 230,000 now. 230,000. All right. And so what did they say in the petition to justify or I guess to substantiate their claim for filing for bankruptcy. I mean, you file for bankruptcy, that doesn't matter. That doesn't mean automatically the judge rubber stamps it. Yes, you're bankrupt. You're bankrupt. Billion dollars. Go ahead, uh, plaintiffs, and split the money up amongst yourselves. There's going to be somewhat of a battle over that, my understanding. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they cite the amount of money that they've had to spend on this litigation. 
Um, but I think the thing that's gotten the most interest from people following this particular case is that the petition goes into lengthy detail about trying to get out of the tort system and in particular multi-district litigation. Um, so there's a lot of crit criticisms in there about the multi-district litigation in front of Judge Casey Rogers there in Pensacola, Florida. Um, it's not necessarily something we haven't heard already. He, 3M has made um, a number of these arguments in front of appeals that it's got in front of the 11th Circuit um, and in public statements that it's made to the press. So, and again, the complaints about multi-district litigation aren't necessarily new either, but I think what stands out is that they decided to make this a key argument in why they filed for bankruptcy. And I don't think, I think that's hinted at in a number of bankruptcies in the past that involve mass torts, but not in this much detail. You don't see the amount of detail. Specifically what they're identifying as some of their complaints is a rushed bellwether process. Um, you know, so a lot of the courts were shut down over the last year and a half. Um, Judge Rogers had planted an aggressive bellwether plan. So she had all those trials happen in the last year. Um, and the results were, you know, a little bit on the plaintiff side, but fairly mixed. There were a number of defense verdicts as well as plaintiff's verdicts. So they basically are saying it's it was kind of worthless. They didn't really learn anything. And they went through all the expenses of going through the trials. The other thing that they have complained about multiple times that they continue to bring up in the petition was the administrative docket that Judge Rogers set up in order to deal with the mass numbers of claims. You said earlier, it is the largest mass tort in the country, and it's one of the largest ever. So in order to manage that kind of litigation, she had a number of the claims be on an administrative docket. And 3M made a lot of complaints about the fact that people weren't filing, they weren't paying the filing fees, but also that the cases weren't vetted and that there were a lot of cases that shouldn't have been there in the first place. Of course, you know, plaintiff's lawyers have been advertising for these cases. So they, of course, bring up the argument that that's generating these claims that don't really have any value and they're just sitting there. And so, you know, why would they settle a bunch of cases they don't think are really worth anything? Um, Interestingly, Judge Rogers has responded to these criticisms, and she did so on Wednesday. She actually scheduled a hearing right before the first hearing in the bankruptcy, um, in part to address some of the procedural issues that I can get into later. But she did note that she had dismissed 65,000 of the cases through her procedure that 3M was so extensively criticizing. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not a bankruptcy attorney. You're not a bankruptcy attorney. <laughs> um, no, neither one of those sounds like grounds for bankruptcy. I mean, like bankruptcy sounds like you don't have the money or you have far more liability than you have assets and, you know, you're not going to be able to pay it out. So there, two of these criticisms were about, you know, how many of these cases were legitimate. Uh, it's not like any of those illegitimate cases went that you know, the supposed alleged illegitimate cl claims went to trial. And the fact that 19 of these cases went to trial. Well, you know, it's they they tried the cases like a regular trial. Right. And Judge Rogers actually said at, at Wednesday's hearing that and she she listened and she repeated what it is that was in the petition. And she said, this sounds like policy issues that need to go in front of Congress. These are not complaints you should be raising in court. And it certainly, she said, isn't really a reason to file for bankruptcy. So she she actually said that. <laughs> Right, um, yeah. In Wednesday's hearing, it's quite it's quite a read if you want to get a hold of the transcript of Wednesday's hearing. Very brief, but very insightful. Okay, is it possible that you can send me that? And I'll put that, <laughs> I'll put that link on on the show notes. You're laughing. I'd love to have it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Why not? All right. Okay. Now, um, you've been you're like the mass tort journalist extraordinaire, and that's why you're here. So there, this is not the first time in a mass tort uh, that the Fortune 500 defendant who's got more money than uh, has been printed, you know, in the in the in the, inter in, the in, in time eternity, has filed for bankruptcy. Johnson and Johnson with the talcum powder claims, the Boy Scouts, um, and the Purdue Pharmacy. I know you've covered a little bit of this. Can you can you? I, and I think you were telling me before we got on today that there was some. Um, uh, you know, some some progress on the talc bankruptcy petition. Can we, uh, Tell us what you know about these, if anything. Okay, well, yeah, obviously mass torts going into bankruptcy has been going on for some time. I think this case strikes me a little bit more similar to the talc case in the sense that you have a 
<clears throat> company filing for bankruptcy that has a parent corporation that is not filing for bankruptcy. And the parent corporation is a large corporation that's very well funded, whether it's Johnson & Johnson or 3M. Right. They're not the ones that are filing for the bankruptcy. It's their subsidiaries. So I see some similarities in that sense. Um, so then the question becomes the legitimacy of the bankruptcy filing. And in the Talc litigation, the plaintiffs had argued that it was filed in bad faith. Part of the reason that they argued that, however, was because the subsidiary was created through this controversial merger process called a Texas two step. And it was created solely for the benefit of filing for bankruptcy. And so that was their premise for their bad faith argument and why the entire chapter 11 should be dismissed. <clears throat> and in February 25th, uh, Judge Kaplan out in New Jersey, he rejected that argument, case went forward, but then it didn't settle. So then the judge had to come up with some kind of, what do we do here situation in May? And he threw out the idea, maybe we should have some trials. And the um, claims committee got very excited, started throwing out a whole bunch of um, proposed trials that were ready to go and could be tried by the end of the year, very aggressive schedule. Um, they had about 12, I think, that they had actually listed. And the judge made a ruling yesterday, Thursday, um, saying, no, I, I don't want to go that route. And he actually sided with Johnson & Johnson's subsidiary, which is called LTL Management, um, on a different way to go forward which is a claims estimation process. And then he appointed Ken Feinberg to be an expert in evaluating those claims. <laughs> and, and, and to mediate the claims, to try to resolve it. No, not to mediate. Oh, not, not to, to resolve. Really? No, it's a different role for Ken Feinberg. And I mean, I should have a story coming out on this pretty soon. So all the listeners can wait for that one coming up. Um, uh, but it's interesting because I did talk to Mr. Feinberg and he did say this was a bit of a unique role for him um, because... Although it sounds kind of the same from our standpoint, no, he's definitely not a mediator and he's um, really more what they call a claims estimation expert. So he's going to be, you know, the parties are both on completely opposing sides under the value and the amount of claims out there. Um, because in talcum powder, you still have people getting cancer and then they file a lawsuit. So you have future claims. And that's a big difference between the talcum powder case and 3M. Because in 3M, they stopped selling these earplugs in 2015. So they've got a, a world of cases that they can kind of get their hands around, whereas talcum powder, they didn't. Um, yeah. Also, 3M did not use a Texas two-step merger to create Arrow. It purchased the company in 2008. All right. And the Texas two-step is a thing that just sounds so patently uh, fraudulent. Sorry for my lack aggressive language but so that was the that was johnson and johnson during the litigation they create this whole other subsidiary solely for the purpose of you know creating you know doing this bankruptcy and getting out from under all these tau cases but 3m already had the subsidiary already existed so they didn't have to go the texas two-step procedure right and it'll be interesting the plaintiff's lawyers um Definitely sound like they're going to fight this. I don't know if it's a bad faith argument that they have because they don't have that kind of argument with a two-step merger. Um, but they they do say they've got other arguments. One of them is the the whole um, latency period of earplugs that's different from uh, where they can actually get like their hands around what is out there in terms of the world of, of claims. So I don't know exactly what it is they're going to say. They're still very it's still very early <laughs> yeah. in all of this, so we'll see. But they definitely do sound like they're going to be raising some arguments against this Chapter 11. All right. And when you say they, do we know who the attorneys will be for the veterans in the bankruptcy, challenging the bankruptcy petition in the, the earplug litigation? No, not yet. But I, I, um, what I was referring to was the leadership team and the multi-district litigation. Yeah. So that would be Brian Elstock, Seeger, and that crew. Right, exactly. All right. And the bankruptcy petition that's been filed uh, has been filed by which law firm? Was it, is it White and Case? Uh, yes, I believe so, yes. All right. So they're going to be handling the, the bankruptcy for Arrow Technologies, for 3M. Yes, that's right. There are a number of law firms involved <laughs> yeah. at this point, but yes. All right. So did you did you follow the Boy Scouts? or the Purdue at all? Do you know anything about their bankruptcy that could, proceedings that could shed light on what's gonna happen here or 
you know. And no, I think I think those are very different because in that case, there's a pretty good argument that those entities did have some financial issues. I think what's going to come up in this case is what came up similar to the Johnson and Johnson case, which is, you know, you've got this entity that owns the bankrupt company that's providing funding, um, and is it really? you know, in a financial distress situation. I think it's more akin to that situation. I mean, we'll see. Again, I'm not a bankruptcy. Yeah. I don't cover bankruptcy, but I think I can hear similar arguments in the sense that if you're saying you're bankrupt and you're financially insolvent, you know, in the Boy Scouts case, that was true. Yeah. In this case, there's a debate because you have this parent company that's very well funded. Yeah. And right. 3M so has said that it's funding it. Um, one thing that's kind of a side note to all of this is that the other thing that came up at Wednesday's hearing is Judge Rogers started asking a lot of questions about, um, I mean, it was a very brief hearing, but she asked a lot of questions about an indemnity agreement that 3M reached with Arrow right after the July 5th mediation talks. The reason this was significant is because the indemnity agreement was clearly a funding agreement that predated the bankruptcy and was with the idea in mind that there was going to be this bankruptcy, right? So she started to question the good faith of 3M in settling the case, because if they were already planning to file bankruptcy, were they real serious about settling this in a mediation discussion? So this made her very concerned. So she she questioned the good faith effort of 3M and said that she would be um, having a hearing coming up to discuss that. That's an interesting development I did not see yeah. <laughs> in some of these other cases. Um, and I would like, I think that would be very uh, of a lot of interest for people to be following and seeing how she comes about that. She, she did sound, she was also very um, upset about the fact that 3M canceled a number of the depositions because the depositions, although there is an automatic stay to Arrow, not to 3M. And she wasn't consulted and, and she was very, we, my colleague did, a, uh, Michael Moore, I did a story about that saying that, you know, she's like, you didn't even make a phone call to my chambers. Um, you know, what up with that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that, that was, um, there are a number of concerns she raised at that hearing and it'll be interesting to see. I mean, obviously, obviously there could very likely be an automatic stay that applies to 3M, but it's not today. So in the meantime, there's a number of things happening in the multi-district litigation until that becomes a decision from the bankruptcy judge. All right, so that's gonna be key because from what I understood about the end of the bellwether phase was that Judge Rogers was now sending a bunch of the, remanding is the, the legal phrase, the legal word, remanding a bunch of the cases back to the courts where they originated for those judges to set those cases for trial. And there are like thousands of them. So- right. I, at this point, those cases are still set for trial until they, unless there's a stay that is put into effect. As long as they have 3M as one of the defendants, which they probably do, yes. And she she set those mediation talks for a reason. She set them because she knew that the Bellwether plan was completed, this she being Judge Rogers, and that she didn't really, really want to send 1,000 cases to a bunch of judges all over the country um, to handle trials. So she was kind of like, hey, guys, here's your last chance because I'm about to remand all these cases. Um, and instead, we're now talking about bankruptcy. <laughs> all right. So let's let's just shift base, a, shift a little bit. Um, about, uh, there were appeals taken on the trials that went forward. Um, and there was one that I had been told was a pretty critical um, in the 11th Circuit, I think, about um, a, a couple of big issues. H have any of the appe appellate decisions been rendered? Have they come down? No, no. The, um, there are two appeals. They're both involving, uh, one of them's the first bellwether verdict. It was like uh, 7.1 million for three plaintiffs. The other one is the third bellwether verdict, which was actually the lowest amount, which was 1.7 million of the plaintiffs awards. Um, but they both raise the same arguments, and most of the petitions focus on Judge Rogers' rulings, both before the trials and during the trials. The one before the trial was pretty well publicized, and that one was basically saying that 3M couldn't use a government contractor defense in the litigation. It was a summary judgment ruling that she issued. Um, 
And the argument that 3M's making is this: these were earplugs they made for the U.S. military. So they worked with the government on the specs and they worked with the government on what they needed to provide. And that they kind of paint a picture that the government was pretty involved in this. So they're trying to use this immunity defense and she shot that down. So that's a really big, big part of the appeals. Obviously, if that got overturned, that kind of throws out the whole litigation in a lot of sense because that's um, that's key to bringing these two, three eminent subsidiaries to trial. All right. Now, again, we're not bankruptcy attorneys, but to me, as we're talking, it, I'm thinking out loud. That to me was the big concern for the veterans was that the government contractor defense, because that kind of wipes out the whole thing. So right. if they are going to ask for a stay across the board, I would just I would assume that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So the appellate courts would be stayed as well. And that <laughs> ruling would not be addressed. So now you're back in bankruptcy court where they're going to, again, try to settle the cases with that one issue that 3M could have just, I don't understand why they didn't, you know, I'm sure they have good reason. They got good attorneys. Why they didn't just wait for that 11th circuit ruling, which could have got them off the hook pretty much entire, as far as I knew, as far as I could see, but I guess we'll wait and see what happens um, through the bankruptcy proceedings. But I want to shift well, first of all, you mentioned something about procedural issues that you wanted to touch base on. Have we touched base on those? Yeah, that was Judge Rogers talking about the automatic stay. Um, I just thought that was really interesting because her response was very much like, no, this doesn't apply to 3M um, and you can't just cancel depositions. And, um, and I mean, it sounds very, but I mean, this is really impactful to what's happening in the litigation, which technically is still moving. Yeah. All right. So. Boy Scouts. Do you know anything about the Boy Scout bankruptcy proceedings, even at the most general level? No, I have some colleagues who cover that one, actually. Um, I think that one is still waiting for the the confirmation plan, but I, I don't know and have an update from last time. All right. So that there are there is big numbers that are out that are being that are part of the proposed settlement. So I know a lot of people are kind of freaking out. Oh, my God, it's in bankruptcy. Um, spent all this time and I'm with my lawyer and now I'm not going to get anything, but in the bankruptcy proceedings with the Boy Scouts, the numbers that they're talking about are, you know, they're 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 pretty substantial, and and you know uh, the Purdue opiate um, bankruptcy proceedings, I believe the I, I'm, is the is the settlement there finished? I think that it came back. That was appealed, right? Because they tried to give a release to the the settlement had a release for the Sackler family, even though they weren't involved in the bankruptcy proceedings and the appellate court said no go that you can't you get they don't get a a, a release of uh, liability if they weren't involved in the proceedings but I, as far as i know that settlement is getting either is done or is getting close and that's also like an 11 billion dollar settlement in a bankruptcy proceedings does any of that sound yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't have an update on those cases, but these numbers are very big. And I'm really curious to see how Mr. Feinberg's going to assess the talc litigation because there's a really big number in that one as well. Two billion dollars is how much Johnson and Johnson subsidiary says it's gonna set up, but the plaintiffs obviously see that as not enough. Um the one thing I, I will point out that's different about 3M than these other cases you're mentioning is the sheer number of cases is huge. Yeah. Um, I mean, just to put that in comparison, the talent litigation is 38,000 lawsuits, but 3M earplugs is 230,000. Yeah. And I think the- <laughs> So, I mean, we're talking, they can just keep getting bigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, listen, you know what, from what I understand, because I'm involved in the litigation as an attorney, from what I understand was there was a million veterans, they get discharged- when they get discharged, they get evaluated, and a million of them were evaluated with hearing loss and or ringing of the ears, and we're getting some benefits for that. So when 3M is now coming back and saying out of this 250 or 230,000 number of uh, veterans that have actually signed up with law firms or whatever, I don't know. I mean, those numbers really, to me, I, if anything, I think there's probably 750,000 veterans out there that have not joined in this litigation yet. And, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, 
people don't know. Oh my God, I should I do it? Should I not do it? It's their choice or whatever. But I think that whole argument, of, you know, about the fact that they contend that sixty some odd thousand or whatever are 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 not qualified, didn't suffer hearing loss or got it elsewhere, or whatever. I think that's specious is, is the word I'm looking for. All right. Well, so, this is Go to ahead. be clear, the, the 65,000 was the judge dismissing those. It yes. wasn't them saying that. But they have made a continuous argument that a lot of these are not filed lawsuits and that people didn't fi pay the filing fees. I mean, it sounds trivial, but this is a really big issue that they keep bringing up because it's when you add up the numbers, it becomes large. And so they're, that's part of their argument that these cases haven't been vetted and that the 230,000 isn't all lawsuits. A lot of them are claims on the administrative docket. Yes. All right, it's, so now, go ahead, go ahead. It's just, it sounds like minutia, but it's actually like a big part of the, the dispute that's going on in this litigation. Yeah, and once, listen, if the court gets flooded with 200,000 lawsuits, you know, I know the filing fee is $500, the court has to take action on all these lawsuits. So that's part and parcel of this whole administrative docket. It's not like the plaintiffs have come concocted some ridiculous scheme where they're just, throwing, you know, a bunch of numbers at the the court. Oh, we're not going to file these cases yet. Let's settle them all and and be done with it. So we'll I guess we're going to this is going to play out. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. One thing I want to mention um is that I all right, let's talk about your art. You wrote an article for almlaw.com on this on this very bankruptcy, the 3M bankruptcy that was published this week, right? Mm -hmm. And what was the name of that article? Well, you're taxing my memory. Wow. <laughs> I, I've written a couple articles since that moment. Uh, but my, but basically, I know in the headline, I focused on um, the fact Don't worry that... About it. Here's the gig. All right, listen, if you're an attorney and you're like fascinated by this whole discussion, you got to subscribe to Law. Oh, just get on law.com and Critical Mass. And Critical Mass, the newsletter, <laughs> ALM. And there's tons and tons of stuff to read and get educated on everything from bankruptcy, social security, mass towards technology. And so I, I did law.com and I'm overwhelmed. Like I can't find, there's not enough hours in the day to read all the things that I want to read there. But one of the things in your article that I read that was definitely news to me was you, I think you quoted one of the veterans as having said that there is a $5,000 offer per person. Well, that was actually coming from, so it's interesting because the lead plaintiff's attorneys in the multi-district litigation sent out a statement, and I, I actually have it here. I thought it might be interesting to hear. Yes, Her, this please. is in response to the filing on Tuesday um, by, by Aero Technologies. Considering that juries have ruled in favor of 13 out of 19 service members whose cases went to trial and awarded nearly $300 million in damages, the trust to resolve earplug litigation claims is woefully underfunded and not the efficient and equitable resolution that 3M is desperately pretending it is. Then they sent a second statement out on behalf of Joseph Sigmund, who is a combat veteran and one of the plaintiffs. And he alludes in his statement that, you know, why would you take $5,000 and live with hearing loss? And it's like the first time I, I was aware of that number, but if that is the number being floated as a settlement figure, and I'm not saying it is, but maybe that's the number that they've been hearing, then you can see why they're pretty far apart on any kind of settlement discussion and why that didn't happen in this case. All right. Have we touched all pertinent, relevant information that you can provide to your audience and my audience? <laughs> yes, I think so. Other than, um, you know, just waiting for the next shoe to drop, there seems to be <laughs> yeah. bankruptcy after bankruptcy happening these days. So we'll see who's yeah. next. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you for, I know you're, everybody's chomping at the bit to hear from you about this breaking news. Thank you for making time this Friday afternoon and I hope you're well, and I'm going to have to bring you back again soon when the okay. next, the next shoe drops. Okay. So yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Thanks that's for talking with me. <laughs> All right. All right. Listen, enjoy your weekend. Don't okay, forget you, you got to rest. Okay. <laughs> Seven days a week, one of them's got to be rest. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of Cuts to the Chase. If you have any questions, follow-up questions, maybe you're like, oh my God, $5,000, bankruptcy, what's going to happen? Please feel free to send me your questions and I'll do my best to answer them, all right? Everybody take, take care and have a good weekend.